Thank okay. you. Thank you, Margaret. And hello, everyone. On behalf of the Friends of the Johns Hopkins University Libraries, I am delighted to welcome you to our 16th and the last episode of the Lunch with the Libraries for this academic year. This ongoing speaker series spotlights the rare collections, pioneering activities and innovations, and outstanding staff of the Sheridan Libraries. We are grateful for the partnership of our co-sponsors, the Johns Hopkins Odyssey Program and the Office of Lifelong Learning for their support in making Lunch with the Libraries possible. The Friends of the Libraries was established in 1931, quote, as an association of persons who take a friendly interest in the general library of the Johns Hopkins University, end quote. Now, 91 years later, we have grown from a small gathering of local book enthusiasts and collectors to a national group with over 700 members across the country, consisting of alumni, parents and grandparents of alumni, faculty, staff, and members of the public who are committed to keeping the libraries at Hopkins vibrant. I encourage you to join us if you are not already a friend and to help ensure that the libraries remain one of the university's strongest assets, the intellectual heart of life at Johns Hopkins. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce Laura McNulty, the Samuel H. Kress Conservation Fellow in the Department of Preservation and Conservation at the Sheridan Libraries. Laura received her Master's of Science degree from the Winterthur University Delaware Program in Art Conservation, where she specialized in conservation of archival and library materials. She has completed internships at the American Philosophical Society, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the National Museum of American History, the National Library of Medicine, and the Library of Congress. Wow. Laura is here with us today to discuss her work with materials from the university's Women of the Book Con Collection, which will be celebrated in a major exhibition opening this fall at the George Peabody Library. Thank you again for being with us. And with that, I will turn the program over to Laura. Thank you, Jim. Go ahead, share my screen. Okay. All right, thank you again, Jim, for that introduction. And a big thank you to all of you for attending this presentation today. I'm really excited to share this collection with you and the work done so far to preserve it. Before we jump into looking at the collection, I want to give you a quick outline for this presentation. We'll begin with a brief exploration of the types of items that are in the Women of the Book collection. I'll then speak briefly about the item level survey my colleague and I are undertaking, and I'll end with a discussion of the conservation treatments of two books. The Women of the Book collection is already quite large with approximately 800 objects and the collection continues to grow. The materials in this collection have one focus, the lives of nuns and lay holy women. Some of the books are quite rare, and in some cases, the only known copies to exist are in this collection. Rather than having hundreds of books in Latin, the majority of the books are in vernacular languages, with the largest number in French, German, Spanish, Flemish, and Portuguese. In short, this is truly a premier collection of materials dealing exclusively with religious women living in the early modern era. I'd like to explore the collection with you by highlighting the most common types of books found in the collection. Biographies make up a large portion of the books. These were often written by nuns in support of canonization or beatification efforts and were often used as didactic materials. 
Bound collections of sermons are also found throughout the collection. These range from sermons for nuns on the occasion of taking the habit or sermons giving, given during a funeral. Probably when you think of a nun's life, you think of a life that is highly regulated and structured. The plethora of rule and conduct books in the collection would support such thinking. I find this particular volume to be quite endearing. Instead of being a list of do's and don'ts, the rules are conveyed through a dialogue, plus the printed paper cover just adds to its charm. Next, there is the category of daily devotional texts. These books are a great example of how the intended use of a text influenced how it would be printed and bound. These volumes tend to be on the smaller side as they were intended to fit easily into the hands of the user. Another type of book which was made to fit easily into the hands were pocket processionals. This example is filled with the music and lyrics for songs sung during major feast celebrations. Processionals are usually beautifully written and embellished, which signifies their importance both to the maker and to the user. We've looked at a lot of books insides, but the bindings in which these texts are housed shouldn't be overlooked. Just like the subject matter and the types of books, the bindings also cover a wide spectrum. From plain bindings like the one on the left, which houses a biography, to the highly decorated binding on the right, which is for a, which is for a German manuscript collection of devotions. And of course, I just had to pop in the printed paper cover just one more time. Although a larger portion of the books are printed, the collection includes manuscripts as well. The topics of these manuscripts range from convent rules and daily devotions to this manuscript on the screen, which is a report of the deaths of two nuns who left a monastery under somewhat mysterious circumstances. In addition to bound items, the collection includes single leaf items, including prints, broadsides, nuns' professions, and other church documents, like this papal letter of indulgence written in the 1550s that grants special privileges to the noblemen of a French diocese. The category of ephemera is always a great place to look in any collection when you want to find out, when you want to find the out of the ordinary items. One of the items in this category is this panorama. Bound in an unassuming red-brown leather, this book unfolds to reveal 18 hand-colored illustrations of the habits worn by different orders of nuns. And here is a close-up of the panorama and you can better see the details included in the illustrations. Another example of ephemera is this transparent illustration. These partially transparent lithographs were first made by printers and booksellers and hung in the windows as a way to decorate their shops. In the mid 19th century, printmakers realized they could sell these as novelty items. This lithograph of the interior of a convent was printed by Reeves and Sons in the 1840s. This and other transparent prints were meant to be lit from behind to create the intended feel of the image. The image on the left shows the scene lit from the back and it truly conveys the warm glow of a candlelit and moonlight, moonlit room. On the right, we see an image of the back which shows the layered structure that makes up the transparent print and previous repairs to the mat surrounding the image. The Women of the Book collection includes items which are known as cluster arbeit. These are items that were made by nuns and were sold to tourists and visitors. The profits from the sales of these items supported the day-to-day -day operations and needs of the nuns. This example of cluster arbeit is a multimedia portrait of Gregory the Great. The portrait is painted on a piece of parchment. Surrounding the portrait are various elements made from metal thread, wool, and small beads. 
The whole item is supported by a laminated paper board. Another example of plaster arbite are amulets. Made by nuns, these popular talismans were thought to contain protective and spiritual powers and sold to tourists and pilgrims. The amulets were typically worn around the neck and kept closed to protect the spiritual properties. It was believed that opening the amulets would release their powers and render them useless. This holy water stoop was made by the nuns in the Congression of the Order of Visitation in Eastern France in the late 17th or early 18th century. Straw has been woven to create the form and the decorative vines, flowers, and buds were made by embroidering the woven straw with thinner grasses. The surface was varnished, which is darkened to the color you see on the screen. At the bottom of the stoop, there is a small receptacle in which holy water was stored. In the center, there is a watercolor painting of the Sacred Heart, which was the emblem of the Sisters of Visitation. And just like the amulets in the portrait, these would have been sold to financially support the nuns. The best way to ensure the long-term preservation of a collection is to become well acquainted with its contents. So this brings us to the second part of the presentation, which focuses on the survey of the books in the collection. For the past six months, my colleague, book conservator Jennifer Jarvis and I have spent one day each week surrounded by the books in the new library at Evergreen Museum and Library, closely looking at the books in the Women of the Book collection. We're capturing information about how the books were constructed, if they are in contemporary bindings or have been rebound, inscriptions and annotations, ex libris information, if there are previous repairs to the binding or the text block, and if so, the type of repairs and who we think may have completed them, and the book's current condition. This is also an opportunity for us to flag items which may need interventive treatment or an enclosure to prevent further damage and ensure the, lo the item's long-term preservation. We've built a database, a screenshot of which you see here, which we hope to make available to anyone who may wish to access the information we've collected. We are also planning on publishing our findings about the bindings and any previous repairs which may have been done by the religious women using these books. One of the great things about this survey is that we get to look at a lot of books, which for a book conservator is absolutely dreamy. A lot of the books that we survey are, were well constructed and have survived intact for a very long time. It can be difficult with those items to get into the nitty gritty of the book's construction. But sometimes a book readily reveals its secrets. Like this book on the screen, which is showing off the printed waste that was used to line the spine of the text block. In addition to the information conveyed in the text, these books give us insight into the lives that the books themselves have led. The photo on the left shows the inscriptions likely written by the many nuns who use the book. On the right, if you look closely along the top, you'll see numbers written in ink. These numbers indicate that the pamphlet may have been bound with other materials at some point in the past. Perhaps my favorite thing that I've come across during the survey are the scribbles, an example of which you see here. Like the, like the inscriptions we saw in the last slide, these scribbles remind us that these books were used and loved and that everyone enjoys a good doodle. So now we move into the third and final part of this presentation which focuses on the work that occupies most of my days, and that is treatment. Most of the books in the collection are in good shape and need little to no intervention. There are some, however, that need conservation treatment like this manuscript. This book contains the rules of behavior for the sisters of St. Elizabeth who lived in Paris. The convent was established in 1628 under the patronage of Marie de Medici 
and the manuscript was completed in 1638. Written in a beautiful and neat hand, the rules were likely copied by a young nun from another rule book as a way to learn all the rules of the order. There are engraved portraits adhered to the inside faces of the front and back boards. And this is the portrait on the front board. And this is the portrait on the back board. Due to the number of library stamps and labels on the fly leaves, researchers and scholars can trace where this book was housed after being made and used by the Sisters of St. Elizabeth. Prior to any treatment, conservators first thoroughly examined the object to fully understand the construction of the book and the condition issues and start to think through a plan for treatment. The main condition issue was the damage to the leather, which weakened the connection between the text block and the binding. And in this photo, we see losses to the leather on the spine. The leather had also begun to split on the front board, which is highlighted here. The sewing thread and sewing supports were partially or completely broken in some spots throughout the text block. These breaks cause the sewing to no longer be able to fully support the text block while it is being used. Typically, conservators don't encourage the use of tape on books. It can be difficult to remove, cause staining, and usually isn't a good preservation measure. However, in this case, the use of tape was actually a good preservation measure. At some point, someone stuck tape between the leather on the spine and the text block. This kept the leather attached to the text block and helped to reduce the probability that it would be lost. Luckily, the tape was easily removed and did not cause any lasting damage. I had two main goals for this treatment. The first was to re the text block so that it would be better supported and better able to withstand use. The second was to re-establish the text block to binding connection. The opportunity to give this presentation came up after I had started this treatment, so I apologize in advance because I'm going to talk about a few treatment steps, but don't have any photos to show you what was happening. After writing a condition report and treatment proposal and taking before treatment photographs to document the book's condition when I received it, I removed the text block from the binding by carefully slicing along the spine edges of the boards. I then removed the tape from the spine and the sewing thread and sewing supports from the text block. The text block required some paper repairs, which I completed prior to re-sewing. I hand spun new sewing supports using linen sewing thread and re-sewed the text block following the same sewing pattern that was used originally. This avoids the need to make new sewing holes in the text block. Once re-sewn, the text block was lined with a medium weight Asian tissue, which you can see in the photo on the right. The next step was to prepare the boards for the treatment step, which would re-establish the text block to binding connection. This step is called a reback. A new piece of leather is used to recreate the binding and re-establishes the connection between the text block and the binding. Before inserting the new leather and attaching the sewing supports to the boards, the leather on the outside of the boards and the engraved portraits on the inside of the boards have to be lifted. Using a special knife and other tools, the leather and paper are carefully separated from the board. They're not completely separated, but enough so I feel confident that the leather and the sewing supports will be securely connected. The next step was to dye the new leather to closely match the color of the, exi the existing leather. Although we buy a lot of brown leather, there is never a shade of brown that is just the perfect color to fit our needs. So I mixed up some dye 
and started testing out different shades of brown at different concentrations. The dyed leather circled in green is the leather I ended up using for the reback. It's a bit more red than the existing leather, but most of it will be covered up by the original spine leather, and I can always do some spot toning to make it blend in better if I later think it's necessary. Before attaching the new leather, I first reattached the boards to the text block. The sewing supports were adhered under the engraved portraits. You can see the exposed cords along the joint in this photo. Next, the new leather was adhered under the existing leather on the boards and over the text blocks, the text blocks spine. In the bottom photo, we're looking at the top of the spine and we see the new leather turned in and adhered under the paste down. In the last step, the original leather on the spine that was held in place by the tape was re-adhered to the new leather. On the left, we see the spine before treatment. In the center, we see the completed reback before the original spine leather was re-adhered. And on the right, the finished treatment. Here we see the book before and after treatment, and the book is now ready to be used by researchers and students. The book that is currently on my bench for treatment is this clasp binding. The text was printed in Lyon and completed in 1516. It is actually two texts bound in one volume. The first text is a book of hours and the second is a Psalter. This book was acquired by a Carmelite nun named Catherine Raoul, who had her name gold tooled on the front cover and had new clasps put on the binding, which were engraved with her name as well. On the backboard, we see clear evidence that the extant clasps are not the original ones. If you look closely in the red boxes, you will see small holes created when other clasps were first attached to the boards. Like so many of the books in this collection, the quality of the printing is superb and the illustrations are beautiful. The Book of Hours is printed in black and red ink and illustrated with woodcuts. The second text, the Psalter, is also printed in, red, in black and red ink. Some of the letters are printed in a blue colored media that is friable, and unfortunately, most of that has been lost. The illustrations in the second text are metal engravings rather than woodcuts. Similarly to the, to the manuscript whose treatment I just discussed, the main condition issue with this book is the lack of a connection between the text block and the binding. The sewing is supported by leather supports and the leather is acidic. So over time, the leather itself has weakened and has damaged the sewing thread. The weakened supports and thread no longer support the text block. Repairs done previously, like the one highlighted in the green box, are beginning to fail. And if left untreated, this could cause damage to the paper of the text block. The leather covering the boards has shrunk, which has pulled the boards towards the spine. And as a result, the edges of the text block are exposed and no longer protected. Because the edges of the text block are exposed, they have been damaged both by use and the clasps. As seen in these photos, the edges have small tears, are dirty, and there are small stains caused by the corrosion on the metal clasps. I had hoped to, pre to present some progress in this treatment, but of course, other treatments took longer than I thought they would 
and I'm currently completing the examination and before treatment documentation. So I'll share the treatment that I am proposing to complete on this volume. I'll begin by removing the existing sewing thread and sewing supports. I have documented how the text block is sewn and will use the same sewing pattern when I re-sew the text block. I'll then complete the necessary repairs to the text block and re-sew it. Then, following the same steps I highlighted in the treatment of the manuscript, I'll complete a reback to push the boards away from the spine so that the text block edges are once again protected. Finally, I'll repair the damage to the gold tooled cartouche on the back board. This book will be on display in the Women of the Book exhibition opening, opening in the fall, so be sure to come to the Peabody Library to see the completed treatment. And with that, my presentation is complete. I want to thank my colleagues in the Department of Preservation and Conservation for always being willing to answer the one million and one questions I always seem to have and for being the greatest teachers an emerging, an emerging conservator could have. To the curators of the collection and the exhibition, I thank them for their research and finding so many fabulous items. And to the library staff and sponsors who made today's presentation possible. I'm grateful to the Samuel H. Kress Foundation and the Harriet and Donlin Long Endowment Fund and Conservation for funding my fellowship. Finally, a huge thank you to all of you for attending, and I'm happy to answer the one million and one questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. That was awesome. And we do actually have a couple of questions. We have some that came in in the chat uh, while you were talking, and they, they are a little bit more technical in nature. So, um, what are the trim sizes in general and what kind of transparent paper were you talking about? Can you repeat the first part of the question? I'm sorry, uh, I didn't the, the trim sizes. What were what? The, what were the trim sizes of the books? I don't know if the person who can, what are the trim sizes in general? Um, <laughs> uh, Martha, I think you asked that if you wanted to clarify in the chat what you meant by that. She also said your presentation was fantastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I can answer the second question while we're waiting for a clarification. And um, to fix the transparent illustration, I just used a thin Asian tissue. It's um, pretty common in book and paper conservation. Uh, we use it in many, many different ways. Okay. All right. I don't see anything there yet. Um, and then the question and answer. Oh, we just had a thank you, Laura. Um, oh, okay. Are all the materials in this collection related to Roman Catholic religious women? They are, yes. Okay, and we have clarification. Trim oh, size great. refers to the page dimensions. I'm art director at JHU Press. And what kind of transparent paper, which you did just answer, was used by the translucent art? Um, so the books range in size. Um, I don't have specific dimensions on hand, but if you just think of a regular book, um, that's pretty much the bulk of the, you know, the sizes of the books in this collection. There's also some smaller ones, which I mentioned, and then um, we have some oversized folios. Um, oh, the paper, sure. Um, so I didn't identify the type of paper as part of the short treatment that I did for the transparent illustration, um, but it seems to have been the lithograph was printed and then there was a transparent piece of paper put on the back and in the areas where they wanted the light to really glow and come through, they varnished those areas of the thinner transparent paper on the back. Um, and I think the paper used to print the lithograph was also thinned a little bit in those areas so that the light would really shine through. Okay, great. Questions are popping in fast and furious. Um, <laughs> how, do you, how do you identify the sewing patterns and learn how to use them? 
Oh, that's a great question. Um, so luckily in most of the books, the sewing thread is still intact and there. Um, so I can just document on a piece of paper where I find the sewing thread. And so we're documenting um, the number of holes that we see and we're documenting where we see the thread and that tells us what sort of sewing was used. And then when I go to re-sew the text block, I just follow the diagram that I made for myself. Great. Um, Earl Havens, who you thanked in your, uh, <laughs> on your last slide, he's one of the, he's one of the curators for the collection. Mm -hmm. Um, and he says, it's so wonderful to re-envision a collection from the perspective of a master conservator's eyes. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the single sheet ephemera and what are your thoughts about their conservation, particularly the items that we have on silk? And how do you treat the three-dimensional close daughter bite? Sure. Well, I think the, ephem the single leaf items in the collection are great. And a lot of them, whether they're on parchment or on paper, they're in great condition, so very little has to be done to make them um, accessible for researchers or ready to be exhibited in the fall. I don't know much about silk, to be honest. I'm not a textile conservator, um, but I know that I would need to reach out to a textile conservator if, more, if a more interventive treatment had to be done to that. Um, and we actually talked with a local objects conservator to talk about the 3D uh, cluster arbite items. And um, a lot of it is figuring out the right tools to use to clean the items and usually working under a microscope because they are complicated and delicate. Um, and like with the varnish on the holy water stoop, um, part of that is well, one thing that has to happen is a discussion has to be had if we want to remove the varnish. And if so, then we start testing um, different solvents, different materials that we can use to safely reduce that varnish. Um, so it's a lot of consultation, a lot of you know, sharing ideas and expertise. Great. Um... I'm going back and forth between the Q&A and the chat, so I will try to get to everyone. This is this is really one of our busiest Q&As. This is awesome. <laughs> um, going back up to Andrea Perry. I think I passed her. Um, how did you get interested in this field? Can you share a little bit about the training that you've had? Well, sure. Um, so I'm the proud daughter of an archivist and historian, and as a young kid, I learned about you know, the importance of preserving collections of all types and um, got to visit a conservation lab when I was young. Um, I took a detour away from conservation in college. I majored in math and then I decided I didn't wanna sit in front of a computer. And so I decided to become a conservator and um, I love it. It's I get to problem solve every day. It's every day is different. Um, and the collections I've been able to work with over time is, you know, they're just it's wonderful. Um, so I went through the master's program at the Winter University of Delaware program, and it's one of four graduate conservation programs in the United States. And I had about, oh, six or seven years of what we call pre-program experience prior to entering the graduate program. And then the graduate program is three years and um, with the last year being an internship. And so did all of that and I graduated and now I'm here at Hopkins. Great. Let me switch back into the Q&A here. Um, A follow-up to Meg, Meg's question about whether the collection relates to Roman Catholic religious women. She's wondering whether the collection might ever expand to include materials from or about religion of other faiths. And I think that's a question for Earl, but I don't know if that's come up in discussions you've had with him. Um, I was gonna say exactly that. That's a question for Earl. Um, I don't know if that's a plan for the collection. Maybe Earl can chime in on the chat. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, we'll let him put something in the Q&A. And yeah. in the meantime, we'll move through a couple other questions. Um, this is really fascinating. I didn't think of this. Um, can any DNA be retrieved from the leather, either human owners or from the animals? Is this ever done? Uh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. So um, different animals have different hair follicle patterns. So we can identify the animal based upon um, the follicle pattern. It's easier to identify the animal on new leather because it's just not as damaged and the follicle pattern is usually more apparent. Um, it can be a bit more difficult on older books because the leather has been damaged and worn, um, but it can be done. And I know there's a group in the UK that is also um, working to identify the animal sources of leather and you can take an eraser, like take eraser crumbs and kind of rub the leather on the books and send it to them and they can, um, it, you know, figure out the DNA from that, which is awesome. Um, human DNA, as far as like what's, you know, how, I guess stuff from our hands as we handle these books, I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure you could. But yeah, I just don't know much about that. Okay. Um, Earl, if you can hear me, I'm going to click on allow to talk so that you can <laughs> answer the question about the expansion of the collection to include other women religious. And also we had a question about the history of the collection. So I'm about to click on allow to talk. Everyone cross your fingers that this works. Well, I can see you. So if you unmute, we should be good. So there we are. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Earl. First of all, Laura, yay! Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I just wanted to um, to chime in to say the collection actually was created by a young person. I, I consider Laura a young person, and a young person called David Ruger, who actually realized that rare books about women were undervalued and underappreciated, and he created the seed of our collection, and then we built upon it. And it always reminds me that, you know, we all learn from each other uh, across generations and across visions of what constitutes a collection. And that's where we've come to um, through that seminal vision. But I actually um, would like to proceed by asking a question of Laura, who's the expert here. Um, I've just spent a week with uh, Hopkins faculty and PhD students at, uh, here in Antwerp, where I'm actually talking to you. It's about six o'clock here, almost there. Um, every single time we looked at books that would have been candidates for the women of the book collection, our copies are always better and nicer and in less beat up condition. And so I was wondering if you encountered a collection that was in Antwerp and it was all beaten up because it was used to death, how would you change your assessment of the collection and how differently might your approach be to its conservation? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I think um, one of the things that drives our decision making here at Hopkins regarding conservation treatment is that the collections are so heavily used. And so our treatment decisions and our interventions really aim to make the books usable again, or, you know, suitable to be used for a long, long time. Um, so I guess if the collection in Antwerp was to be used heavily, then maybe um, more interventive treatment might be called for. It's hard to answer this question without seeing the collection, of course. Um, but if it's, you know, really just to be stored and maybe referenced every now and then, you know, proper storage, whether that's enclosures to protect the books, um, a good environment obviously is key. Um, but it really, yeah, um, assessing the collection, it's, it's, those decisions are really made based on kind of the end use of the items. Okay. Um, we have another question about whether uh, there are plans to digitize these books in ephemera, and actually most of them have been, mm -hmm. and um, 
I'm going to ask either Earl or Greet to put in the chat the uh, direct URL to the Internet Archive. You may remember, and in a lot of Laura's slides, the slide credits at the bottom said Internet Archive. We got a grant from the Arcadia Fund, and about three quarters of the collection has been fully digitized, and they are beautiful. So um, hopefully one of my colleagues will put that uh, URL in the chat for me. Um, so one question was, how much do you have to shield? Do you have to do a lot of shielding of materials from light damage? How, how fragile are these materials in terms of light? Um, for the most part, these books, um, they're printed. And so um, while we don't want to blast them with light, um, just kind of your typical light exposure in an exhibition or when you're using it in a reading room, is it's going to be OK. Um, things that are illuminated, um, hand colored, um, manuscripts that are written in ink that may contain iron, those are really susceptible to light damage. And so if those things are going to be on display for a long time, um, you may want to lower the light levels. Um, and then when they're not on display, just make sure they're stored in a, you know, in a box in a dark room somewhere. Okay. Um, one of the other questions we have is, are, when you've been working, are there any challenges in particular with 3D materials? And that was Earl's question. Um, I'm going to answer it in two ways. So, because um, books to me are, you know, they're 3D materials. And uh, I think the most complex feature of books is that they have to function. So unlike you know, paintings or maybe other prints on paper that are hung on a wall during an exhibition, these books have to be used and they have to function and that's um, the priority. And so sometimes balancing the, you know, improving the functionality of the book with maybe the fragility of the materials that can be challenging. Um, for the 3D cluster Arbite, um, I think the challenge for me is that a lot of these materials are outside of my wheelhouse, outside of my comfort zone. So I, I'm probably proceeding more cautiously, more carefully than maybe I have to, um, but it's, it's all challenging and it's all, you know, forces me to think critically. So it's, it's all great. That's awesome. And speaking of a little bit of, of ephemera and the unusual items in there, the ephemera piece that you showed, was that actually, was that printed? And if so, how many colors would have resulted and how many passes, or was that hand colored? The lithograph, the uh, transparent. Um, I believe that's what she's referring to. Um, so I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. Um, I think colored lithographs, if I'm remembering my print history correctly, there, it was probably printed in multiple passes, but I have, I think this would have been hand colored. Um, it's just the detail is very fine. And so I think that would have been done by hand. Okay. Um, the next question, I'm actually gonna call on one of my colleagues again to put into the chat. Sure. Uh, we've had someone ask about the dates for the upcoming exhibit at the Peabody. So, um, I, th I think Heather, if you don't mind popping that in there. And then I love this question. I've loved all the questions, but this one <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a really cool one. So can you tell us a little bit about what your work is revealing about book production and early modern convents? Was it the nuns themselves who originally bound these books? That's a great question. It's actually one of the things we're trying to figure out in, a, in our survey. Um, I don't think the books were produced in the convent. Um, I think some of the earlier manuscripts were written in the convent. The convent had scriptorium, so um, some of the nuns would have been highly educated and trained to create these manuscripts. But then I think they were um, sent to a binder outside of the convent to be bound. And a lot of the books that were seen, the binding is very typical for the place, the time period. So. These texts were probably printed and bound by um, printers and binders outside of the convent. Okay. 
So early on when you were talking about um, the, the pre-treatment survey of the first book you worked on and, and you talked about how scotch tape, which makes us all go, ah, yeah. uh, actually, <laughs> actually was somewhat beneficial to what you ended up doing. Um, but we have a question that talks that um, asked you to comment on some bad conservation treatments that have happened in the past. Are there toxic treatments from past generations or icky to use quotes, which the questioner did that, that you all have had to go back and, and undo? Um, so it's really difficult with books to undo treatments. Um, usually there have been coatings that have been put on leathers to help preserve them, which have turned out to be not great. And of course, those are not reversible, so we can't remove those. Um, they're not necessarily a conservation treatment, but I know, um, in the 19th century, green colored book cloth was made with arsenic. Um, so bright green books could be dangerous. Um, again, something we can't remove from the cloth, but it's something to be aware of. Um, but for the most part, you know, a lot of the previous repairs and treatments that we see, while we may not do them today, you know, the, the people that owned these books and cared for these books, they're, they're doing their best. They're doing, you know, the best with what they knew. And the same goes for conservators. And I know in 50 or 100 years, there's going to be conservators looking at my treatment and being like, what the heck was Laura thinking? Um, so it's an evolving practice. And we learn new things all the time. And so we're constantly learning and reevaluating our own approaches. Okay. Um, I have I have a question. Um, you've been in a number of different institutions and treated a lot of different books. Um, what's what's your favorite? What was your favorite treatment? And it's okay. It doesn't have to be one of ours. To be honest. <laughs> um. Well, I think my favorite book treatment so far is actually one of ours. Um, it's not from the Women of the Book Collection, but I just finished the treatment of a 15th century book of hours. And when I received it, the book was unbound and just in its sections. So um, I did you know, a treatment pretty similar to what I presented today. I re, I re sewed it, um, I made new boards for it. I got to cover it in beautiful alum top leather. I mean, it was just, you know, a great learning experience. And um, I got to make different sewing models to figure out the best sewing pattern for the book. Um, so I think so far, that's been one of my favorites, but I think this class binding might, might be one of my favorites too. Okay. And actually, I, I was curious about that. Is that common to, for someone to take a class off and redo it? I think so. I mean, I, they probably broke all the time. So I'm sure they just had to be replaced just out of necessity if they wanted to keep the book closed with clasps. Okay. Um, so we have another question um, that goes a little bit to the scientific side. Uh, is mold an issue? Do you need to be careful of your health while you're working with books and conservation? Yeah, so um, with the Women of the Book Collection, specifically mold hasn't been a problem, um, but in other collections I've worked with, uh, there's been uh, mold broke breakouts, either active or past. And um, yeah, you know, we treat those very carefully. If we're working with an active mold outbreak, we obviously wear respirators and, you know, hand protection and just make sure we're working in an area where it won't affect anyone else as we try to remediate it. Um, but yeah, it's kind of an ongoing thing we always keep an eye out for. And that's why we so closely monitor environments that collections are stored in. Um, as the humidity rises, mold, you know, can become, can break out and become a problem. Okay. And we have another question. Uh, one of our attendees did a, was at a workshop at the Smithsonian and they talked about the use of music in book bindings. Can you talk about any printed waste you've come across that's been particularly interesting and have you seen any music? 
Yeah, um, one of the things Jen and I get most excited about during our survey is when we see printed or manuscript waste on the spines. And um, bookbinders, you know, they're we're a crafty bunch, and so you're always using scraps when you can. When you can, so a lot of the time, um, music sheets, music musical scores were used as linings for the spines. So um, that's where we mostly see the printed and manuscript waste is as linings. Yeah, and interestingly enough, uh, some of you may know that Hopkins has a nice online exhibit of digital uh, digital library of medieval manuscripts, which are actually holdings of other universities. But we finally got our first leaf of a Roman de la Rose as part of a, a binding waste. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that was a good question. Yeah. So. Um, so is there anything about this collection that speaks to you in a particularly meaningful way? Um, have, did, have you developed a relationship with this collection that you might not have with other collections? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know yet. Um, I've really enjoyed the survey and we've come across different bindings that are delightful and that make us very happy to see. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I'll, I'll ask me in a year and I'll maybe I'll have a different answer. <laughs> yeah, and one of the clarifying points that came from Earl is that most collections of early modern origin are about men and this yeah. one and this one isn't. So has that had any special resonate resonation? Re yeah, is that resonated? <laughs> it's definitely yeah it's definitely interesting and you know refreshing to see um but yeah i don't know yeah <laughs> well i i do want to thank you again for the time that you've spent this um has been I think a terrific way for us to close out our year of lunch with the libraries. Uh, clearly, you can tell that there's a lot of interest in the work that you're doing based on the questions that we've gotten yeah. from people who participated. So um, again, thank you, Laura, for your time and your talent. Um, and thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. We will be sending a follow up email that will have the recording so you can go back in and hear some of these Hear, hear some of these great questions and answers again and see the amazing work that Laura did and share it with other people. And um, we hope that you will join us at a future program. So thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend.